Well, I think we'll get started. Um, a big welcome to everybody for joining us tonight. My name's Paola. Um, we are recording this tonight, so just be aware of that. If you um, have any concerns, please turn your video off. Now, I'm going to pass over to Anne Yule, who's going to um, do our acknowledgement of country. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. It was sounding so good too. <laughs> Hello everyone. I would like to acknowledge that we're here tonight on the land of the Darug Nation, the traditional owners of this land. We acknowledge the present Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who now reside within this area and pay respect to their ancestors and elders past and present and to their heritage. We acknowledge and uphold their intrinsic connection and continuing relationships to country. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders belong to the oldest continuous living culture in the world and their sovereignty over this land was never ceded. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. So, the purpose for tonight is to provide fellow residents of the ben Federal Electorate of Benelong um, an opportunity to understand what um, a group of us have come together to, why a group of us have come together to form Voices of Benelong, give you an understanding of what it's all about. We're going to hear from our spokesperson, Michelle Rawson, who will give you an overview of Voices of Benelong and why it's come to life and what we're trying to achieve um, with this movement. And then we're very privileged to have Cathy McGowan, the former independent member of INDI, whose campaign and time in parliament has been a blueprint for the Voices of Movement and has raised the profile and the role of independence in our federal parliament. As we go along tonight, um, please use the chat function to ask any questions. Uh, we will hold questions until both Michelle and Kathy have spoken, just in case there's any crossover in the answers. Um, at the end of the night, we have some lucky door prizes to give away. We have three signed copies of Kathy's book, so please stick around. It's an excellent book, having read it myself. Um, if, uh, if you've got any questions, we'd rather them in the chat at the moment um, rather than hands up, but we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So now I'm going to hand over to Michelle Rawson. Michelle has been the driving force of the formation of Voices of Benelong and um, is going to give you an overview of what we're all about. So handing over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Paula. Um, so I'm Michelle Rawson and I just wanted to talk to you about how Voices of Benelong came into being, what we hope to achieve and where we go from here. Um, together with some friends, I started Benelong Climate Action Group and some of you I recognise from Benelong Climate Action Group. So thanks for coming across with us and finding out a little bit more about what we're trying to do. Um, one of our main aims when we started... Benelong Climate Action Group was to lobby government at a federal level for stronger action on climate. After writing numerous letters, signing petitions and receiving empty rhetoric in reply with standard slogans of meeting and beating, technology not taxes, um, our group arranged a meeting with John Alexander. Two things struck me from this meeting and the first was that John Alexander appeared to be genuinely ignorant that there was a climate crisis. And that was a pretty concerning for a member of the ruling party. Um, he rated himself as sitting somewhere between alarmism and denialism, believing that climate change was something we had to worry about in the future, further down the track, and there was no urgency to act. He appeared to genuinely believe that his government was meeting and beating climate targets and was already doing enough. He thought the gas-led recovery was a good thing and appeared satisfied with the current plan to effectively backload the cost of climate action onto our kids. Ignorant, willfully, willfully or otherwise, of the fact that our ecosystems are collapsing now, that later will be too late, and that every moment of delay increases the future financial burden that our kids face. So given that, 
The second thing that struck me was that he was openly disillusioned with his own party, stating that he wasn't aligned with any factions within the Liberal Party and had no power to act on anything. He was, in effect, openly stating to us that he was ineffective as a federal member. And this, I believe, is the problem. I don't believe that John Alexander is powerless. He has more power than any one of us. He has his power to vote on our behalf, to be a voice for us, his constituents. That's the way the electrical, the electoral system was designed to work. But he won't do that. To do so would be to risk his position in the Liberal Party and his job. So John Alexander instead votes as instructed by the Liberal Party 100% of the time. And since the last election, the Liberal Party has moved very far to the right. So how do the constituents of Bennelong have a voice in Canberra? The simple answer at the moment is that we don't. So what, what do we do? Somewhere in the last five months, voices of Bennelong have come into being with the idea of achieving better political representation for the people of Bennelong. Much work has been done behind the scenes. We've registered as an organisation, developed a constitution, designed logos, ordered T-shirts, built a website and developed a strategic plan. We're currently in the process of opening a bank account for fundraising, designing brochures for letterbox dropping and building a community through such things as our Facebook site, town hall events, hosting kitchen table conversations. Um, we also have very strong links with other groups in the area, both environmental and community groups. And we enjoy a fantastic support network with other voices of community groups that are springing up in electorates all over Australia. Um, all of them starting from a similar point to us with disillusionment at, disillusionment at the state of the party politics in Australia. So where do we go from here? The first phase of our strategic plan is to listen to the community to find out what issues are important to the residents of Bennelong. Prior to COVID, the COVID lockdown, we had been running kitchen table conversations where people meet in small groups of up to 10 to discuss which issues matter to them the most. The answers have been recorded anonymously and collated. With the lockdown, we've been advertising a similar survey on Facebook. Results so far show that the standout issues are climate action and integrity in politics, which we pretty much know, as well as greater female representation in parliament, diversity of media, defunding of the ABC, decreased funding for universities and education. Um, I will say that for most of the surveys we have had so far have been filled in for people um, who stayed on the survey that they usually um, tend to vote more to the left. So we are really interested in hearing from, from Liberal voters as well. You know, we want to know whether people are happy with the level of representation they're getting. Um, so, so that's where we're at at the moment. We have many more, um, many more people to listen to. So the listening project is, is where it's at right now. And where to from here? So ideally, once we have canvassed the community and we, um, we are confident that we've got a good representation of, of people across the electorate um, and issues identified, we will advertise to find a community independent to run at the next election based on the issues identified as important to the people of Bennelong. Um, we believe that this is entirely achievable, but it will depend on in reality when the next election is held and how quickly we can canvas the community and build our community and find a viable candidate. Um, so if the election is held this year and time isn't on our side and um, we haven't found a candidate, our plan B would be to continue to grow this movement. We won't give up. There's so much at stake. We'll use the information that we've um, collated to lobby for better representation with whoever the federal MP may be. That's our plan B. Um, but given that there are so many amazing people in Bennelong and in most likelihood the election will be held next year, we have our sights firmly set at the moment on plan A. Surely we can find an 
actual local to represent us in Bennelong, someone who can be a voice for the most challenging issues that we face at our times. With so, with so much that is phenomenally frightening in the world, I would be con seriously concerned if this government gets back into power for another four years with a clear majority. The Voices of Movement is something we can do that is positive and has the potential to be a real game changer in federal politics, to break the deadlock on climate and the influence of vested interest groups and the hold they have over our politicians. Um, but Cathy McGowan is going to talk a little bit more about what an independent can do based on her experience in Indi and what they've done in the community there, which is just amazing. But if, um, if you're interested in learning more, if you're interested in being part of this movement, um, there's many things you can do to help. We would love to have you. Um, the simplest thing at the moment that anyone can do is fill out one of our surveys if you haven't already done so and let us know what issues matter to you. Um, email the survey to friends or share on Facebook. Tell them what it's all about, why it's important. Um, check out our website, uh, which is published today, very new. Each click on it will bump it up the algorithm. So that would be, you know, fantastic. I think Paul is going to drop it into the link on the chat, the um, link to the website. Um, other things you could do at the moment is have conversations to help build our community, invite a group of friends over and hold a kitchen table conversation or have a picnic in the park, um, COVID, following the COVID restrictions. We've set a format that's easy to follow and questions to ask that are easy to record. We can also provide facilitators for kitchen table conversations or whether you do them through Zoom or whatever, it's, you know, every, every little bit helps. Um, other things that we would be looking for at the moment are volunteers for letterbox deliveries with brochures coming in the next few weeks. Um, if you've got any design skills, <laughs> we would love to hear from you. Um, if you would like to be more involved, email us with any ideas or suggestions for future events. This group is organic, it's grassroots. Roots. We aren't politicians, we're all learning on the job. Um, we're just ordinary people who are finding our power. Um, any expertise you have, we would love to hear from you. If you know someone who would be an amazing candidate, please do send them our way. We would love to hear from them as well and speak to them. Um, if you're on Facebook, join our group, check in regularly to see where we're at and ways that you may be able to help, similar for our website. We started this group because it belongs to anyone who wants to be involved. It belongs to all of us because we are the voices of Benelong. And together, I believe that we can achieve some stronger representation for our community. Um, so that's, that's all I've got to say at the moment. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Um, <laughs> now we're going to move to Kathy. Now, we are very honoured to have Kathy with us tonight. Kathy came to prominence um, in Australian politics during and after the 2013 federal election, um, where she ran as an independent in her electorate of Indi. The campaign was not only successful in unseating the sitting member, who was the only Liberal member to lose their seat in the 2013 election. But it was also the germination of the grassroots led movement, which we now know as Voices of or Voices For. Kathy and many others worked tirelessly during this time and in her time in Parliament. And she's now part of a highly skilled team at the Community Independence Project, where she shares her time, energy and knowledge for other new and potential independent candidates. Kathy is with us tonight uh, to tell us more about the Voices for Indi campaign, the Voices of Movement, and the importance of having independent representation in our federal parliament. So with no further ado, over to you, Kathy. Hello. Thank you very much, Parla and Michelle. Um, and I, I see some people there from Bradfield. Hello, Stuart. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, Barb, who's there from Indi, is one of my neighbours. Hello, Barb, it's lovely to see you here, and Joe as well. So I've got a few things to do in talking to you, and then um, I'm really open to questions, because I think you know what you need to know. But I'll, I'll just say a few things to set the scene going. Uh, being a Member of Parliament was a very surprising thing for me, it surprised me because when I started out, I didn't think it was possible. 
that one, the seat would vote for me, uh, and then two, the, the people in my electorate not only liked what they got, but they voted for an independent three times in a row. <laughs> and it just goes to show if, if you'll never know if you don't have a go. So have a go. So, and I was surprised by not only how much fun we had, but also how we absolutely changed our electorate by engaging with people and, and not relying on the parties. So I want to just talk a little bit about what we did, and then I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about why independence. So Indi is in northeast Victoria. It's on the outskirts of Melbourne, goes all the way up to the Murray River, and it's the Snowy Mountains, False Creek, uh, Hotham, uh, Buller, beautiful country. But it's what's called a safe seat. <laughs> the Liberals or the National Parties um, won it always. And we felt a whole lot of us felt we were really ignored and particularly so when the members of parliament didn't really care for us. They maybe had a whole lot of other reasons why they were in the party. So we had a sense that no one ever listened to us on anything. Um, and we had issues. We had a real problem with our train line. We had a huge problem with mobile phone coverage, getting, getting access to any internet. We have, we've got appalling post-school education participation. And our biggest export was our young people. You know, they got up and went. Um, so there was no shortage of grizzling and complaining that things could be better on a whole lot of issues. Uh, and what, when a group of us got together, just a bit like what Michelle has outlined, we thought we could do better. <laughs> we had an average member of parliament, but we thought not only could we do better, but we thought we probably deserved better. And if we didn't find it in ourselves, there was no one else going to do it for us. Like there wasn't going to be a cavalry that came over the hill and said, oh, Indi, you deserve, a, you deserve a much better member of parliament. We'll do the work for you. That doesn't happen. You've actually got to do it yourself. And it takes people like you who are here tonight to do the work. So that's what we did. It was a group of ordinary human beings who happened to have good skills uh, and we worked well together and we grew over the period of time that we did it. So we actually started in June 2012. The election was in September 2013. So we had quite a long time to sort of get organised. But really, once I was appointed, which was in May, we didn't have very long to run the campaign. May, June, July, August, really. So it was a very short time period. So it's totally possible. So lots more to tell you about what we did. And those who will get that signed book I hope you share it around your friends. Don't keep them to yourself after you've read it and get lots of people to just read the story of Indi. But the thing that really amazed me was how possible it was that we could have said, no, we weren't going to do it, but we did. And in, in the first election, we had 500 volunteers. In, in, and when Helen Haynes was elected as the independent in 2019, she had 1,800 signed up volunteers. So it just goes to show this is all possible. People want better and people are really prepared to put their hand up. But they need a group of people like you to ask them. People, people need to be tapped on the shoulder and, and talked to. So you really, really need to have conversations with people. So that's the first bit I wanted to say, look, out of tonight, have conversations with people and you'll be surprised by how many people are really interested and want to know more. So the second thing I want to talk about is the importance of independence in Parliament. So what, what I love, I'm, I was on the, I'm what's called an independent, or was, and I was on the crossbench. And if you're on the crossbench, that means you're not part of the government and you're not part of the opposition, which is a really unique position. And not many people actually understand it, but it means you never vote, you, you never oppose everything just for the sake of opposing it. Your job is to make things better <laughs> and to work with everybody to make things better. So you're never in opposition. Now, of course, sometimes you don't vote with the government because the legislation is not good enough, but mostly you're there in the middle of the road to make things better. And I'll just give you some examples. So Zali Stegel. Zali comes from one of the wealthiest electorates in Sydney. Uh, and she is the voice for the world, for Australia on climate. And who would have ever thought that it would be a crossbench person who's introduced the climate legislation? 
really superb legislation. She's researched the best from the world and put it up there. And it's, it's, it's the crossbench that's done it because neither the parties on either side, because of their party structure, can do that. And, and when you talk about your current member of parliament, when he, when, and you were saying, Michelle, he feels ineffectual, well, totally he's not. At any time, and within the rules of the Liberal Party, he is able to cross the floor and vote. He has chosen not to. So he's not ineffective because of the party. He's ineffective because him and so many people in the Liberal Party in particular go, no, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to upset that. I'm not going to, I'm going to be a good little boy. I'm going to be an effective and a girl, and I'm not going to cross the floor. And if just one of them had crossed the floor, we would have a change on climate. It's as simple as that. And I, for the love of me, can't work out why they don't do it, but they choose not to. So Zali has been able from the crossbench as an independent to do the legislation, put it before the parliament. Now it hasn't got through the parliament yet, but, and people say, well, she hasn't been successful. Well, I say, well, more than Malcolm Turnbull was successful. Malcolm Turnbull couldn't get climate up, but zali has got it before the house. So incredibly effective. And then there's Helen Haynes, who's my member of parliament. And Helen has a bit like Zali on climate, but Helen has led the charge on integrity. She's, she's developed this fantastic, two fantastic pieces of legislation, put it before the parliament. And again, at any time, any of those Liberal Party or the Nats could vote in favour of it but they've chosen not to. But Helen has taken the lead role for it. And then Andrew Wilkie, not many of you know Andrew, he's from Hobart in Tasmania. And Andrew, he's a much quieter member. He's not out in the national news so much, but he's almost single-handedly has taken up the issue of gambling. And he's been able to get Royal Commissions into Crown Casino. And any of you who've been watching that, just a bit like the banking, you just hear about uh, in Victoria, I, had, I didn't follow the New South Wales one so close, but just incredibly bad pr practice happening with gambling in Victoria, you know, like shocking stuff. And it was the Royal Commission that, that was the background to what Andrew's work that has brought it open. So when people say, well, what can, you know, what can independence do? You know, a huge amount and they do it. And then I, I rang up Rebecca Sharkey. Rebecca Sharkey is also on the cross bench. She's from South Australia. And she said, yeah, and when you're talking tonight, she said, don't forget to talk about the things that we stop. Not only do we do things, but the crossbench stop bad things happening. And the, the example she gave me was, it was two years ago, the government wanted to introduce compulsory drug testing for everybody on Centrelink. Do you remember that? It was like, what? Drug test the members of parliament would probably be much more useful activity. But anyhow, um, the crossbench, together with Labor and the Senate, were able to stop that happening. And there's just a whole host of things that the government wanted to do that the crossbench and the Labor Party and, and the Senate have been able to stop. So they're a really powerful group. But what I love about being an independent truly is that my number one job always was to represent my electorate. So, and I, and I feel I feel so sorry in a way for the backbenchers like, like your member of parliament who feels powerless. I never felt powerless because every single time I voted, my vote, it was a conscience vote and I knew that I was representing my community. And there's nothing nicer than being able to do that, to be at the main table, to be at the centre of the Australian system and to be able to vote directly for your electorate. Whereas for the members of the party, they don't, they have, well, they can choose not to, but they basically vote all the same. You know, just like zombies, they turn up and they vote. And frequently in parliament, you know, I'd be in there voting and I'd read all the legislation and I knew all about it. And I'd speak to my colleagues who are on the cross bench and I'd saying, you know, do you know what you're voting for? And they say, no, nah, haven't read it. No, nah, don't know anything about it. Because they didn't have to, because they were just herded into the teams. Whereas that's never the case for the cross bench. So I was able to give voice to my community and I loved it. I really was so proud to be able to do that. But I also know it made a difference to my community because they knew that I was theirs and they absolutely held me to account. Um, and when I would go out and visit people, but you know, hundreds and hundreds of people come and talk to me, come and make sure they told me what was going on. And so it was a really close relationship between your member of parliament and your community, which is not the case when you've got a party in the place. And the other two things I want to talk about is that about being an independent is that 
there's a sense that you're not never by yourself, um, that you actually, um, you, you, well, you belong to the crossbench, so you've got your other colleagues there, but that I was totally surrounded by my community. And while I was, I was sort of the spokesperson for my community, but so many other people stood up and took leadership roles. So for example, and I'll just tell you this quick story. We, we have a lot of, we had a lot of, one of the, one of the groups in my electorate that had, was really worried about the issue was mental health. So I said to these, this group of young people, I said, well, look, if you if you get your act together, come up to parliament and you can work in my office for a, you know, a, a week and learn how parliament works. Uh, and I'll introduce you and explain to you how everything works. So they did that and they wanted to talk about mental health. So this young guy who happened to be a member of one of the local councils wrote me a speech about the problems of mental health in Wangaratta. And I was able to deliver the speech that he wrote to the parliament. But he said, Kathy, that's not enough. I just don't want, I don't just want my voice. I actually want some action on this. So what he did is he came back home and then he formed a task group. He got all the main, the hospitals, the doctors, the young people, the local government people all together. And he formed, you know, a task group. They came up with a plan for how we would get a headspace and do some work with young people on mental health issues. And then, and then he did some costings and got it all organized. And I was able to introduce him to the budget office, the parliamentary budget office that also helps with costing. So we worked out how much it would cost and how it would all happen. And then, I introduced him to the Minister for Health. Now, the Minister for Health wasn't real keen to see me, but he was really keen to see my constituents and ended up giving $2.5 million to that group of people from my electorate to set up a mental health service, which is now running. And so people say, oh, you can't do anything as an independent. And I say, no, nah, no, nah. you can do anything you want to do. You just got to be clever about it. And you come from an organized position as opposed to um, doing deals or, you know, wanting, um, you know, sports rorty stuff. It didn't work like that. It actually worked because we did the work and we demonstrated the need. So never let anyone say, say to you, you know, independents can't do anything. Look at Zali, look at Helen, look at Andrew. And I, and I will talk to you till the cows come home about all the things that we would do. But my biggest, my biggest thrill was actually representing my community. And now I'm no longer the member of parliament. I've been out of the job for two years. And I got, I, I had the funniest experience. I went up the street, Bob, you'd like this, to Yakandanda, which is my local town. And I was buying some groceries there. And one of the people who works in the deli section, she looked at me and she knows, she knows me. She knows I'm Kathy McGowan. But she looked at me and she said, ah, oh, Helen, as in Helen Haynes, it's so lovely to see you here. And I had such a chuckle. I, didn't say to her, oh no, look, I'm not Helen or Kathy, because what's happened in her mind, we, we've become a member for Indi, and it doesn't matter if it's Kathy or Helen or whoever it is, they know that we're representing our community. And I just thought that was the, the nicest compliment I could be paid, that uh, um, the community love their independence and they want more of it. It's not something they're going to give up lightly. So I'll stop talking at that note because I'm really happy to answer questions. But, but I just before I finish, and I'll probably say it later, I, I just can't stress to you enough how worthwhile it is what you're doing. And the thing is, I say to you, if not now, when are we going to really engage with our democracy? But the timing is now. And if not you, who else is going to do the work that needs to be done? So thinking about if not you, who now you might not be the person to put your hand up to be the candidate but you will be on the team of the person who's going to do that and then if you start networking with your friends and your colleagues and your family before too long you'll have your 500 people on your database and once you've got 500 you're ready to go that's that's that to me is a really significant number so i reckon in the next you know even couple of weeks you could really get get that number on your database because we've got we've got 45 people here tonight so if ever if all of you, even if you if you all went and got 10 people, and that 10's easy onto the database, that'd be 450. So, and a couple did a few more, you'd easily get your 500. So I'll leave that with you, the challenge to after tonight to see if you can get a critical mass on the database and then get underway with um, you know, more Zooms and more discussion on the different issues. So enough from me, but I'll be really happy to answer questions. Excellent. 
Thank you, Kathy. That was awesome. I've read your book and it's super inspiring. I've heard you speak a couple of times now and I always feel really um, empowered and ready to go when we, whenever I hear you speak. Now, I've got a few questions in the chat. Um, I'll no particular order, more because I'm just trying to find them. But the first one is for Kathy. Um, it is from Jane saying, Kathy, how do you manage to campaign against the major parties with all of their support and funding and convince the rusted on voters to change the way they vote? You're just on mute, Kathy. There's a there's a couple of things in that question. One is I never tried to convince people. <laughs> and it's a really fundamentally interesting thing because how people vote is how they vote. And most people vote the way they want to for a reason. So I never tried to change people's minds and I never ever got into an argument about it. What I hoped I could do was give them a choice and be the better choice so that they could, they could make their own decision that, I, that we in Indi were give, offering them something better, that I was a better candidate um, and that voting for an independent would be better for Australia than voting for a party. So that was fundamental to being an independent. So I never got into the weeds and I never argued with my opposition and I never argued with rusted on people. What I would say is, um, and particularly in my electorate, so my electorate at that time, it had a Liberal Party member of parliament and a very strong national party group. Now, now you, you don't have that, but in Indi we did. And I was able to attract many of the very rusted on national party people that to vote a vote of one for Cathy, and then they could vote two for the Liberal Party. But be a protest vote, because they actually wanted to vote one for the National Party, but they couldn't because of the two party agreement. So I say vote one Cathy, and then you can vote two for the Liberal Party, and that can be your protest vote. And lots and lots and lots of the National Party did that. So they felt that was their way of telling the Libs that they didn't like the candidate and they didn't like lots of their policies. Does that make sense? So it wasn't really a matter of telling them to change their mind. It was giving them an option. But to answer the question, how did we campaign? Well, our secret weapon was the community. Like we had more people on our database than the whole Liberal and the National Party and probably the Labor Party had in their membership. Like we had 500 people and Helen's got 1,700 people. So we had people power. And each, and if there's basically in Indi, there's 100,000 people. And I knew that I needed 25,000 first preference votes. So I needed one in four people to give me their first vote. So you've got to have that number. How many votes do you need? And where are you going to get them from? So I actually didn't need lots of liberals to change their vote. You know, liberals could keep voting liberals till the cows come home. But I did need the National Party and I did need Labor and I did need the Greens to give me their first vote. And in fact, that's what I got. You know, I got, I, I got my 25,000 votes, first preference votes. And then almost every single, pre anyone who voted any other way with their first vote, all the preferences came my way as well. So understanding preferences is really, really important. You need to, you need, your team need to understand. And, and I'll put my web page up in a minute, but it's got some really good resources there for how preferences work. So we, whereas the parties used money and advertising and they had a huge budget, we used people and conversations and offering a better choice. And basically that worked. And I think I, I said I targeted the young people, but we also targeted, we targeted the National Party voters, but we also targeted young people, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 years old, because they were rusted on. Um, and we were really able to engage the young people in the electorate and particularly through social media. Uh, and, and they all said, look, we're voting for Kathy. We want to change. Uh, and, I, and I got a huge support from the young people in the electorate. Awesome. Um, the next question I think is for Michelle. It's from Dave saying, as climate activists, why wouldn't half of us be sympathetic to just voting Greens? They already have the infrastructure and human capital and knowledge. Why compete with them? I think in our electorate, the Greens are never going to get up. And I think that's that's just reality. I think we're in a safe Liberal seat and, you know, be that what it may, it's it's 
it is what it is. And I think to get real change, we're not going to get it from the Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party's moved quite a long way to the right. It's not, it, you know, I think Barney B. Joyce was making a deal today to get action on climate, um, that he would he would support a net zero target if, if we, you know, literally the taxpayers paid him $250 billion to, you know, for, for the coal industry, which is it's insane. I mean, that's what we're looking at, I think. I think personally, I, d I don't even know if I identify left or right or or whatever. I know that I wouldn't vote Liberals. Um, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that a Green, that Greens have just had so much brand damage done by the Murdoch media, by major parties, the Liberal Party, that they would they would never get up and bend along, you know. And I, I, I don't know. I want representation. It's all. It's they're also a party, and I think for me, parties are just a a bit on the nose. I, th I think the Greens are probably one of the better parties. They don't accept political donations. But, you know, I, d I don't know. Yeah. Interestingly, when um, Andrew Wilkie actually ran as a Green candidate in Benelong in 2004, and there was a swing to the Greens for that um, during that election, um, and then 2007, Maxine McHugh had an even bigger swing when she ran and won against John Howard. Um, so there are green voters in the electorate, but it's just not enough to make that representation change, which is what we're actually looking for. So we can have that voice in parliament rather than just yeah. voting for the party that aligns with us and in, in, in other ways. Preferences go to Labor, which is also backing a gas-led recovery, which is just insanity. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Michelle. So another question for Kathy, and I am jumping all around the place just for people who are wondering. Um, the question is from Shamira saying, are you seeing more independence running across the board in recent times? Mm. So no, not really. Uh, I think in the last election, there were 145 independents ran. So there's never been a shortage of people running as independents, but they very, very, very rarely do good, get elected, because it's a really tough job. Uh, it's not tough. You have to be, I don't think it's not so much tough, but so I'll rephrase that. Lots and lots of people think, oh, I'll run as an independent. I want to be there. But very few people actually not understand the complexity of getting the community behind you, being a strong candidate and running a good campaign. So you've got to have those three things. You've got, to, you've got to have enough people behind you to do the work, which is what the parties basically have. Then you've got to have a quality candidate who can convince people to vote for them. And then you've got to have a really good can, campaign. But if you don't have one or the other, it's really hard to get across the line. So it's very rare for a standalone independent to get elected. Uh, there, there was one a while ago called um, Peter Andron. He ran in Calair, which is the seat around Bathurst. And he, but he, he had a huge name. He'd been a news reader on um, the local TV for years and years and years. So he, he had a really big uh, following. But once he got elected, he was, he was re-elected three times in a row. And another, another single issue um, uh, independent was Ted Mack in Sydney. But he sort of started out in state government and moved on, moved on to federal government. I think the difference, what was the difference this time is, is what again Michelle said about these voices for groups. They're organised. They, they they know that they've got to form uh, an incorporated body to, to do that stuff. They've they've got to do the social media. They've got to have clear purpose. They've got to have good values. So that's and there's and then people are sharing that knowledge with each other. Mm -hmm. So the the groups are able to build build the skill. Um, and I and I think this this election. I, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get a whole lot of more independence on the crossbench. I mean, I would be really happy if we did. But if we if we get Helen Haynes re-elected, Zali re-elected, Rebecca Sharkey re-elected, Andrew Wilkie re-elected, and if we got two more, that would just make such a difference. Now, ideally, I would like 10 more. If we got, you know, five more, six out of Sydney and three out of Victoria and two out of Queensland, it would be fantastic. And if you get involved in this discussion, there are voices for groups in all those states, plus South Australia, plus Western Australia. But the amount of community work that we have to do to get you over, get over the line is quite a lot. And you need really good leadership. So I'm saying it to Michelle and to Paula as well. 
um, you, 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 your core team has got to be really skilled in, in administration, in organisation, in dotting the I's and crossing the T. They've got to, you've got to be able to work with volunteers because hopefully you will have 500 volunteers. So you'll need a volunteer coordinator to help you do that work. And then you'll need a candidate and the candidate themselves will need her own support team around her so that she can, she can do her work. So there's a lot of people needed and there's a lot of organisation. And it's, it's a big ask for a community to be able to do that. But I think it's possible. Like we did it in Indi, Warringah did it, um, Wentworth did it as well. Um, Mayo does it um, and it happens Andrew Wilkie in Tasmania so it's totally possible it's just you've got to put your head down and your bum up and have a really good team around you and do the work yes yeah that's for sure we've already um, in the first month or so we've done a lot of work just trying to set things up it's taken more time than we probably realized um Another question from Dan is would publicizing current MPs voting records be a step now, I think that's in regard to understanding the populace, understanding how they vote. And I think mm -hmm. nearly all the voices of groups are very um, trying to make sure those voting records are very transparent. I don't know, Michelle, if you had anything further on that. Um, on our website, we've got a link actually to John Alexander's voting record and it's quite um, phenomenal what he votes for on our behalf. And I am pretty sure if the, the majority of people were engaged in politics in Benelong and knew what he was voting for on our behalf would be quite shocked. I was quite shocked. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's not what I would have ever considered to be liberal values. I mean, it's very, very far right. It's not, you know, voting voting for a weakened model of um, of a federal ICAC that is, you know, came out today in the Herald that it's worse than the the model they're trying to get through is worse than having no ICAC at all. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's quite astounding with the level of of corruption in the papers every day at a federal level that. That the, you know the major parties aren't going to be the people that will introduce this legislation because they've they've got a lot to lose and they've yep. got a lot to gain by it the way it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, a legal question from Eric McCoy. McCoy, can a climate action group which is not is nonpartisan endorse an independent candidate because technically the independent is not part of a political party? I would I say. Sorry, Michelle. I, th I think, you know, from a person who started a climate action group yeah. who started off as nonpartisan, it's very difficult to be in that space and continue on a nonpartisan space. I can see climate action groups and networks all across Australia lobbying and coming together to, to not support this government and it, I don't think anyone cares who gets in but on climate this government isn't up to the job and you can't be in that space you can't be reading about climate action and what the government is doing every day and be aware of it and think that they have any chance of getting strong action on climate they just don't you know it's not going to happen under a liberal government and, and that's reality there's there's no you know I, th I think to be nonpartisan. Benelong Climate Action Group, we will be coming up to the election looking at what each of the policies um, under each of the parties on environment will be, and that's probably as, as nonpartisan as it gets. But me personally, um, it's it's very difficult to remain nonpartisan in climate Yeah, with, with a government that is leading us in the opposite direction, not just not acting, but leading us in the opposite direction and, and funneling money to fossil fuel companies left, right and centre because they're donors, because they're political donors and that's, you know, it's a massive concern. Yes, well, I feel the same way. It's why we're all in Voices of Benelong. Um, next question for Cathy. Um, can you just say how you appealed to people? Were you asked about your views or did you present yourself as just a cool, independent head? And how mm. important was your background? Mm -hmm. Look, that's such a that's such a good question. And when you're finally and and I know um, Bradfield is thinking about this, when you're when you're shortlisting for your candidate, you you have to find somebody who's going to relate to the community. So I'm I'm of the community, 
so how did I appeal to the community? Well, I grew up here. My family's, lots of my family's here. You know, I belong to this community. So that, that it wasn't so hard to appeal to my community because I knew them and they knew me. I'd, I'd worked around the area and I knew lots of people. But, but of course, there are segments within the community. So a lot, is, a lot of does, did have to do with my background. Like I, I, I'm a farmer and I was involved in agriculture and I was, had previously been the, the president of Australian Women in Agriculture. And in that position, lots of people knew me. So when I say I appealed to the, the farmers, that made sense. But also I, I, I lived near the major um, urban area, which is uh, Wodonga. And I'd done business there. So I had really good connections between in the community in Wodonga, like me and my family and others were well known there. But once, and, and once I got underway, how did I appeal to people? So I had sort of a spreadsheet of, of arguments to make. So people would say, well, independents are useless. They've never done anything. So I had things that I would talk about, like I have with you today, about why independents are always at the table and their votes always a, a conscience vote. So that's one of the things. And then people would say, well, here's my issue. You know, the trains are a problem. What are you going to do about the train? And I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I've got to get to Parliament first. But I, I know that the current people have done nothing about the train. They've been in office for 10 years. They've done nothing. So at least with me there, you know, I'm going to be trying. So you can choose to vote the same way and get the same result, which is no result. Or you can choose to make a protest vote and then give me a chance. And then if I deliver on the trains, then you can vote for me again. So I, and the same with mobile phones. So I held myself up as an example. So I had a whole lot of different sort of positions to give people. But do you know what it was? I think the real key that got me elected was the young people. And the young people loved the fact that I would listen to them. So when people would say, well, young people would say, well, you know, what do you think about marriage equality? I'd say something like this. I'd say, well, I'm, I'm really happy to give you my views on marriage equality. But before I do, will you tell me what you think about marriage equality? And then the young people would talk to me about what they thought and I would listen and I'd actively feed back to them and engage them in, in a whole, the whole, whole conversation about what it was like to live in society. And when they'd finished and I'd sort of thought, well, I'll tell them what I think about marriage equality, but by the end, they weren't even interested what, because what they'd done is they'd had a chance to talk and, and, and to be listened to and to be respected. And I think that was one of the things that, and, and, and of course, when I got a member of parliament, that's what I did. I, I kept on listening to people um, and then I stayed in touch with them. I'd get their phone number or I'd get their email address. And um, if I made a speech in parliament about marriage equality, I'd send them a copy of the speech saying, you know, dear, dear Charlotte, I saw you up the street the other day and we talked about marriage equality. You might be interested in the speech I gave in parliament the other day. And in the speech, I talked about you and how I met you up the street and I'd send it back to them. So I was constantly making the connection between my community and parliament and, and weaving the circle for people so that they could see that they were important. And, and, and that's, that's what good independent does. Whereas if you're a member of a party, you don't do that because you owe your allegiance to the party, not to your community. Yeah. It's a really good point. It's the listening that's we're, that we're missing, I think, is, the, is really why Voices of Benelong has come together. It's so that we will listen and it's, uh, it's almost like a funnel. So let's listen and then use that information collectively to try and make change. Um, one more question here from Philip. How do you combat the idea of major parties run that minority government or independence leads to unstable government? when it actually forces the major parties to negotiate with representatives from a wider range of the community. Mm. It's a popular comment around you yes. here. Well, I was a member of parliament between 2013 and 2016. In that time, the Liberal parties had three prime ministers. Like talk about, um, and one was far, <laughs> far, far right. Abbott, like, you know, as, as odd as you could possibly imagine and incredibly unpopular as a prime minister. And then you had Malcolm Turnbull, who was suave, sophisticated Mr. Sydney. And then you get Scott Morrison, who's a born again Christian and imports all these people in. So like talk to not, not only unstable, but, you know, like unreliable and not constant and all over the place. 
And the, and the Labor Party was similar. They just went through prime ministers like anybody's business. So I don't think you could actually say that the parties lead to stability. But I don't think that's the real answer. I think the real answer is that the crossbench uh, represents 24% um, of the population. I'm, I'm putting this into the negative. If I could find a way to put it into the positive, it'd be better. But 24% of the population don't vote for the major parties. So 75% so of the population vote for minor parties. And their voices just don't, don't get heard unless they're a Queensland national who doesn't like coal, who likes coal, then they get hurt. But so for 24%, the crossbench actually reflects their perspective. And they're not unstable. Like, let me just tell you, the crossbench has got Bob Catter and I think, you know, Queensland. And this was, I used to always think that the five of us sort of represented the diversity of the population. You had Bob Catter, Queensland. You had Cathy McGowan, sort of centre, centre right-ish. Um, Rebecca Sharkey, a bit like me, centre right. Um, then at that stage, we had Andrew Wilkie, who was, um, he represents a Labor seat. So he was much more lefty than I. And then also on the crossbench at that time, we had Andrew Wilkie, um, Adam Bant. And Adam Bant was the, the, the Greens representative. So between the five of us, we sort of covered off. And we were all very stable. They, they, we constantly kept on getting, re except for Karen Phelps, she didn't get re-elected, but everybody else got re-elected. But I'd also like to talk about Finland and Denmark. Uh, they are governed by coalitions. And I love the Finland in particular. Have you seen the photo? Do a Google. Finland has got a young, she's not youngish, she's 30 or 40, maybe even 50, woman prime minister. And she's in coalition with five, four others. So there's five in coalition together. And the leaders of all those other minority groups are all women. So I just think, now this is, outrageous I know but oh imagine Australia where we had Brittany Higgins, um, Grace Tame, put you in there Michelle, uh, Gord and Helen Haynes and Zali Stegel and Rebecca Sharkey running the country. Now truly I would like that. I would really really like that. Now I know it's a bit too much for a lot of people because they do like their old blokes being there but oh my god before I die, I would just love to see young female faces. And I know this because you got young people are so much better educated than I ever was. You know, like, you know, I'm in, I'm in my late sixties now as I'm lots of members of parliament, but you know, we were educated last century. We're not, we're not digital natives. We haven't had the experience of living in the world that you, you guys have. And, and you're so much cleverer than we ever were. And you know so much more. Uh, so I'm, I'm desperate for the age of our leadership to go down, but also to it actually to reflect the diversity of our community. It, it would make me so happy. So anyhow, they, yes, they constantly say to me, too many, too many people on the cross bench, you can't trust them and you don't know what they're going to do. And I just say, oh, well, that's, look at Zali Stegall. Zali is mainstream Sydney. Look at Helen Haynes. You know, she's got a PhD in health and she was before, she's, she's a epidemiologist. You know, she's mainstream Australia and Rebecca Sharkey and Andrew I mean they're not going to hurt the country they're really good people doing good work better than some of the people in the government and I suppose I'd finish off with that you'd say yeah but look at what we've currently got we've got George Christensen running the government you know is he stable we've got Craig Kelly running the government you know is he stable so you know what are you talking about surely we could do better than some of I don't like getting caught up in personalities I have to say but those two are sort of outstanding in there in their disruptiveness, I think. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, I'm conscious of time and I think we've um, covered most of the questions and they've been great. If everybody wants to have a quick look through the chat feed, um, there's also been some questions answered by Kathy and some of our um, links are in the chat feed for if you want to get in touch and get involved, if anything, to um, be able to fill out the survey at a minimum would be fantastic because that information just helps fuel everything that we do. Um, a huge thank you to Kathy for joining us tonight. Yeah. Now, the next, uh, it's been fantastic, as always. It's brilliant to, um, to hear you talk. What we're going to do now is our lucky draw prize. If you just, um, I've got a random number generator here, and we're, I'm just going to run it three times to give, and 
Joanne, my able assistant, is going to read out the names. And if you're not here, we'll still email people. But if you're a winner, we'll email you and we'll arrange for your um, book, Kathy's book, to be sent out. So, Joe, have you unmuted? I'm going to. I'm going to do the first one now. Unmute. I'm unmuted. <laughs> oh, you can hear. I'll can sit. you hear this? Okay. Okay, okay you've got to tell me what number. 28. 28. Number 28. Rod Organ. Yeah. Say that again. Rod Organ. Excellent. I'm not sure if Rod's on the line, but let me run it again. I'm not sure if you can hear the noise, but it's quite noisy. <laughs> and excellent. 41 is the next one. Uh, Margo Kingston. Margo Kingston. <laughs> and then I think Margo already has a copy of my book. Margo's already got a copy. Yeah, I'd run it again. Okay. Number six is the next one. Oh, number six. Who was it? Stephen Phipps, P H I P P S. Excellent. And then the last one is number 47. Um, McIntyre. Say that again, sorry. Greg McIntyre. Uh, Gregory McIntyre. Gregory McIntyre. Excellent. So, guys, we'll send you an email and arrange for your copy of Kathy's book to, uh, to wing its way towards you. So a massive thank you again to Kathy and to Michelle yeah. and to everybody for joining us. It's been really exciting yeah. to have so many people turn up for our first information night. Please um, keep in touch on all the links, Facebook, our website, email, Check out Kathy's website, check out the Community Independence Project. And um, we are also on Twitter, but we'll probably see a lot of you around anyway. <laughs> but so thank, thank you all. Before, Paola, oh, before you finish, yep. so can I just say about the 10 people? Could you just remind people to do that, to get in contact, find, you know, find, find 10, 10 people. Yeah, because that way by next week, and if you just do it over the weekend, get on the phone, send an email out to people, people you know and trust and you think will be interested, and they can be your family and they can be your you know, friends and colleagues because um, you really do need the database to get going and, you know, that mm -hmm. 500 is a really good number. Excellent. Correct. Yeah, and so subscribe to on the website because that will be the best way to um, also get information for those not on social media. And T-shirts arriving any day. Yes. Excellent. In voices of Better Long Teal. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good <laughs> night. Thank you. Good Thank night. You.